Good afternoon. Should we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Thank you, Lord. We have come again to study the lessons of the past, and we pray that you will help us to learn uh, much from this and apply it. We pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right, our lesson that we're going to be dealing with is from Light Bearers, Chapter 10, which is Organizational Development. Uh, one of the key things in this chapter has to do with the development of the literature ministry, which eventually uh, gave place to the ABCs, which we have now. In 1868, four ladies met for prayer on a regular basis on Wednesday afternoons in Elder Haskell's home. Their focus was on their children. The ladies were praying for their children, but as they did, they felt that they needed to pray for their neighbors. And uh, it wasn't very long before they began sending out letters to people that uh, had maybe backslidden or had grown careless uh, or friends of theirs. So they began to expand their missionary efforts. In 1869, a lady by the name of Maria Huntley moved to town and proved to be an outstanding organizer, and she became the uh, president of the director of their group, which was uh, developed, which was uh, uh, organized in 1869 by Elder Haskell as the Vigilant Missionary Society. They sent out hundreds of tracts and small books and uh, so forth. In 1870, Elder Haskell was appointed to be the president of the conference, Southern New England Conference. His first action was to develop the New England Tract and Missionary Society, which was really just a, an advancement of this vigilant missionary society, placing it on a conference-wide basis. He divided the uh, conference into districts as the, lady had, as the ladies had divided their smaller area into districts. He divided into districts, and in each district, they had a leader who was appointed. His responsibility was to organize a, um, a tract and missionary society in every church. So as he did, it expanded throughout the conference. In 1874, James White, uh, was very much impressed by what they were doing, and he wrote a journal each month called the True Missionary Journal, which would help the ladies in their work. And by the way, they started with four. It soon multiplied uh, to, to by double, and then it continued to grow, and of course now it's on a statewide level. Uh, in the same year, 1874, the General Conference organized the Tract and Missionary Society and appointed Elder Haskell the business agent. Elder White was appointed the president and Maria Huntley the secretary, a role that she filled until she died in 1890, about 16 years later. In the meantime, this whole movement was uh, stimulated by Ellen White, who was urging the distribution of literature. Over 50 tracts, health books, Sabbath school readings for the home circle, 
uh, were developed by uh, this time. And eventually, this uh, Tractor Missionary Society gave way to the Book and Bible House, and that eventually gave way to what we call the ABCs. In the meantime, the literature itself, the literature program was in the process of developing, although their contribution to its development was immense, but it was also developing on a broader level. Ellen White said, if there is one work more important than another, it is that of getting our publications before the public, thus leading them to search the scriptures. This statement that she made early on was a very important means of encouraging them to develop the literature work. In 1880, Elder Kellogg decided to take advantage of the pattern that he observed everywhere. There were uh, uh, people who were selling all kinds of things from door to door, and they would take, uh, take orders and then deliver them later. And Dr. Kellogg decided that he would try that himself. And uh, with his book, which was a home handbook of domestic hygiene and rational therapy. What do you think of that for the title, <laughs> for a short title? <laughs> At that period of time, they tried to put in the whole picture of what, what the whole book was about in the title. So it was quite around 1,600 pages, which was a sizable book. He trained a group of of call porters and sent them out and they sold hundreds of thousands of his book, which indicated that this was uh, uh, something that would really uh, be possible and encouraged the same type of thing on a more, uh, on a general level. In the meantime, George King had been one of those group that, um, that came down from Canada, but in what he really wanted to do was become a preacher. And uh, yet, uh, he, was, he had uh, speech problems, it made it very difficult for him to, to uh, express himself. But Elder White, realizing his intense commitment, uh, decided that something must be done to help him to develop some way, and so he contacted uh, the one who is called Uncle Richard Goddard. Uncle Richard was the one who sold his team of horses in order to buy uh, an updated uh, uh, printing press. And whenever he came to the print shop, he always spoke of a buck and, and uh, buck and um, there were two of them, two horses. Anyway, they're pulling away, he would say. <laughs> so he gained satisfaction from seeing his, his money at work. At any rate, <clears throat> Uncle Richard took him in. And Elder White thought well, if, they, if they, Uncle Richard could take him in and, and keep him, give him board and room until the summer, that he would send him out as a helper on one of the evangelistic teams. In the meantime, George King was so eager to uh, be able to be a preacher that he would uh, spend all of his spare time preaching to empty seats. And the time finally came when they gathered a, a congregation together so he could preach to them, see how it was doing, but he made, it was such a fiasco that uh, it looked like there was no, no help at all. And it was at that time that Uncle Richard's wife said, well, now, why don't you uh, have a ministry of selling Christian books? He had already had experience selling Kellogg's book. 
So he thought that was a good idea. And he began taking uh, orders for Signs of the Times and Review and for the Health Magazine and for whatever else uh, that was available. And then he thought of something. That book, Daniel and the other book, Revelation, which Smith had written, two separate books, one of Daniel, one of Revelation, he thought, if those books were put in one book with nice illustrations, I could really sell that. And so he went to the press and uh, encouraged them to publish the two books in one with illustrations designed for selling to the public. They did so, and as a result, he uh, developed a real Carl Porter ministry, and it wasn't very long before this idea caught on and they began having people who, who dedicated their lives to selling the work full time, not just on the sideline. And uh, so it was that our literature work was gradually developing. In the meantime, the ladies and then the conference, and then later, when uh, Elder uh, Haskell was uh, appointed the general conference president, first thing he did was to encourage the development of this. He had already been going from conference to conference, helping them to develop a similar program, but now it became a general conference uh, program. I think I must have run backward. <laughs> At the same time, Elder Haskell also was responding to Ellen White's continual earnest appeals for city evangelism. And uh, he began to organize a house-by-house -house canvassing program in the cities, and the canvassers offering to uh, not only uh, provide treatments and so forth, but to uh, hold Bible readings where they were accepted. In 1883, the local societies uh, in the various states were combined into a general conference uh, tract society, missionary society. In 1886, there were 25 major city missions. Now those city missions all have had several different things. Uh, a, quarrel, a, uh, a, a place for the workers to live, and uh, it had a place to store books uh, and uh, an office at various things, besides the 25 major ones, there were a number of minor ones. And the major ones were in cities like New York, San Francisco, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. In, in 1886, there were 102 experienced workers who had 224 helpers assisting them in their work. So that in the 1880s, we made a great deal of advance in the major cities. However, the, con the cost of operating this, these uh, city missions was high and it wasn't very long before they dropped away. In the meantime, one of the ways with the ministers serving as evangelists, and they were not pastoring churches as such, there needed to be some way of bringing people together. And so they had the plan of a district uh, quarterly service meetings. And during that uh, district meeting, each district would not only have a quarterly service where they uh, it had the ordinances, but they had uh, 
testimonies. They called them social meetings. They would have testimonies and everyone who came was expected to give a, a testimony. If they weren't able to come, they were expected to write in their testimony. So this uh, social uh, meetings were a, a major uh, impetus in the spiritual growth of the membership. In September 1 to 7 in, in 1868, they uh, held a camp meeting in Wright, Michigan. And uh, there in that meeting, they held three or four social meetings a day besides campfires at night and uh, opportunity during mealtimes for to share experiences. And at Ellen White's encouragement, they soon began to hold camp meetings all over the, um, the country, uh, all over the United States. And uh, these meetings were often, had many, many people come, and especially on Sundays when Ellen White would often give temperance lectures. There were a great deal, of, a great many people that would come from the cities and towns around. In some cases, they even had a, the railroad even provided a separate uh, rail service to the campgrounds. <clears throat> in Grover, Cleveland, um, Grover, Massachusetts, I should say, in 1776, there were 20,000 that came out to listen to Ellen White's temperance sermon. And this was largely due to the uh, effort of Mary Clough, Ellen White's niece, who was serving as her secretary, who became her advertiser. She would send out materials for the newspapers to put in and so forth. We've talked about Sabbath school development before, and we'll give a little review now of the pattern from the beginning. Elder White, James White, uh, began his focus on the youth in 1852 by the youth's instructor. And in 1853, he started a Sabbath school in Rochester, New York, which Sabbath school then became an example and other, uh, other churches uh, followed that. But it was uh, John Byington and especially Merritt Kellogg who spent their time in a special way developing Sabbath schools. In 1863, uh, Adelia Patton, uh, be, uh, began to develop materials for the children separate from the youth. So there began to, and there had been no central organization, it just individual Sabbath schools here and there. Some were strong, some were weak. But in 69, G.H. Bell encouraged the development of a, a system that would make it possible for the strong Sabbath schools to encourage and help the weak ones to develop and, and by uh, forming an association of Sabbath schools. In 1877, the California Conference developed a Sabbath school association for the whole conference. And that same year, Michigan followed with its Sabbath School Association. In 78, uh, the General Conference formed an association of all the Sabbath schools, so that there, by finally, by 1878, there began, became a General Conference Sabbath School program. Interestingly enough, the man who led that was D.M. Canwright who within a few years would uh, fall away from the faith and become an enemy of the Adventist church. 
he, but he was the one who was appointed to be president of that association. In 78, uh, Kellogg uh, began to print, now this is John H. Kellogg now, Dr. Kellogg, began to uh, promote the development of health and temperance society. And by January 5, 79, uh, the uh, Sabbath School Association, uh, I'm sorry, by 79, uh, Kellogg was appointed uh, the um, president of American Health and Temperance Association that covered the whole denomination. In the same year, uh, the General Conference uh, passed a, a, a statement that says that it was the duty of all members to become members of the Health and Temperance Association. It was interesting, they had three different pledges they could sign. Everyone who became a member had to, um, to pay a, a small fee and to sign one of three pledges. One pledge was to never drink alcoholic beverage. Another was to, to abstain from tobacco as well as alcohol. The third one was one that pledged not to use any narcotics, including tea or coffee, whatever else there might be. In those t days, they didn't have the narcotics problem that we have today, but but they uh, swore off from all narcotics. Now it's interesting that it took a long time for Seventh-day Adventists to decide to organize as a church. There was much protest, but when they did organize, they began to realize the value of organization and they became involved in many institutions, nearly all of which were established or in, inspired in, and uh, uh, got their being through the efforts of, of uh, Elder James White. So that in 1874, he was the president over the General Conference over the Adventist Publishing Association, over the Western Health Reform Institute, over the General Tract and Missionary Society, and over the SDA Educational Society. Now, earlier he had been the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Benevolent Association. By this time, he was no longer the president, but now he is the president of five major institutions all at one time. Can you understand why he broke down in health? Now this is after he had broken down in health and had come back mostly, but never did fully recover. In fact, those who knew him said that you would never be able to understand the power and the drive that he had before he had the nervous breakdown. He never did fully recover that. However, it's obvious that he was the mover of all of these, and those who were moved were glad to have him lead their institutions. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1879, Luther Warren and Harry Fenner, as young people, decided they needed to do something for the young people in their, in their church. And so they started out with the fellows. They thought, well, we'll meet together in Luther's bedroom uh, with a group of fellows, all those who wanted to meet to pray and to uh, study and to plan to do missionary work would meet in his place. It wasn't very long till the girls said, well, why can't we join? So they moved to the living room and the girls joined. And, uh, but Luther Warren uh, and Harry Fenner were the ones who stimulated the beginning of our youth department, which uh, was not something that uh, Elder White was there to 
to lead out in. But uh, I was wanting to tell you that Luther Warren has had a great influence on me. I did not live soon enough to know him, but my parents were under his spiritual tutorage for some time. And they, uh, I would say he made a great contribution to their uh, spiritual development. It was in 1880 that James finally decided that he would have to retire. Um, he had never fully regained his strength and uh, was now laboring and decided that he would need to quit. But the sad thing is that it was extremely hard. Can you understand how a person as involved as James White was, can you understand what would happen if he suddenly ceased all of these things? It was not easy. And the next year or two was really a difficult year for James White and for the leaders that took his place. <laughs> because he did have wisdom and he wasn't always satisfied with decisions made. And uh, extremely difficult for him. Uh, his son took his place in some of those uh, operations and he felt dis distressed that his son didn't come to him for counsel more than he did. The fact is that his son, that was Willie White, undoubtedly had to uh, not keep going to his father because he needed to develop his own understanding and his own, own processes, but it was very difficult for James. Within about, well, by 18, uh, August of 1881, uh, James um, had taken a, a very bad, had a very bad temperature and never recovered and, and passed away. Ellen White was there with him also sick at the same time. And it seemed to her that she would not be able to last either, but God healed her, brought her back, and she for another, well, 35 years, she continued to lead the denomination, I mean to, to lead in spiritual uh, dimensions. Now, we're going to do a survey of the doctrinal developments, which would be uh, Lightbearers chapter 11. The Lightbearers uh, discusses a, an 1872 set of 25 articles declaring what Adventists believe. But in those same articles, it insists that we accept no creed, but the Bible, and that this was only a matter of, of a set of statements that would be useful in helping people to know what we believe. And so we're going to review the doctrinal developments in light of the 1872 uh, statement. In the 1872 statement, it says that... Uh, uh, that there is one God. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting that they did not deny the Trinity because uh, our key men at the beginning of our movement uh, were anti-Trinitarian. James White and Joseph Bates were both from the Christian Connection Church, which was strongly opposed to the Trinity. But why were they opposed to the Trinity? Well, they were opposed to the Trinity because it was a false doctrine of Trinity. For instance, the, the normal belief with Catholics and Protestants at that time was to deny the personality of the Godhead and to state that 
that the God was without form or shape or parts. Do you understand what that means? Can you understand why they believed at that same time that a thousand spirits could dance on the point of a pin? There's no, there's no, uh, sh there's no form, no, there's no substance. Now, what is it that we can worship that has no substance, no form, no shape, no uh, 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 nothing at all, no personality? How can you worship a being who does not exist in any form of reality? The fact is, this concept of God was a false concept. The Bible says that God is a spirit. But what does it mean? Does that spirit mean a disembodied non-entity that floats around somehow but doesn't have any, any need to float because it's really no personality, no form, no shape, no parts, no face, you know, no tongue, no feet. Uh, one of the things because of this false concept of Trinity, when Ellen White was first in vision and she saw Christ and when she first talked to him in vision, she was eager to ask him, does your father have a form like you have? What was, his, what was the answer? The answer, yes. So there was one member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that didn't have to wrestle with the problem of a non-existent God, which really is what it amounts to. Um, it is of interest that although men like D.M. Canwright, which we mentioned a while ago, W.H. Um, um, Wagner, and, well, even E.J. Wagner, were... Um, did not believe in a trinity. But Ellen White, from the beginning of her ministry, did believe in a trinity. And she believed <clears throat> that there was never a time, she wrote this in Desire of Ages years later, there was a not, never a time when Christ did not exist and <clears throat> that the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, the Christian connection taught that the Holy Spirit was simply a mysterious essence of some kind uh, that uh, represented Christ and the Father. But she said there was never a time and that he was in every sense God and that in him was life, original, unborrowed, underived. As a matter of fact, it took time for the brethren to, to uh, grasp this reality. But before James White died, he testified that the, that the anti-Trinity doctrine was more uh, uh, a serious uh, matter of evil than was the doctrine of Trinity. There's no evidence that he became a Trinitarian, but he was certainly on the way. And undoubtedly, uh, Ellen White's role was not to bring new doctrine, but she held that doctrine from the time she was a girl, before she was given her first vision. She had that concept and did never change it. And eventually, by 1900, the church generally had accepted that doctrine. And it's of interest that M. L. Andreasen was so shocked when he read this statement in, in Desire of Ages. He said, well, that she must not have written that herself. Somebody else put that in there. And so he made a trip to, uh, uh, to Elmshaven and asked if he could see her files. And he asked to see the file, files where she was preparing the Desire of Ages. And he examined it and found in her own writing this statement. 
And it was then that he was able to understand. But it was so much understood by most of the people that, that we were opposed to the Trinity that it was a shock to him to read the statement in Desire of Ages. Another issue that took time to develop was the issue of atonement at the cross. However, this and several others in this, uh, I'm not dealing uh, with the book's views all the time, but there's several things in this chapter on doctrinal development in which the authors were incorrect, and this is one of them. As a matter of fact, I was certainly convinced of their view that our pioneers taught that there was no atonement at the cross. That was something when I grew up and when I went to college, it was taken for granted that our pioneers denied atonement at the cross. But when I wrote the book, Questions on Doctrines Revisited, I sent a copy to Bob Pickle. Do any of you know Bob Pickle? No one does. He's quite a researcher. I sent a, a copy of, uh, of my manuscript to him, and he read what I said about and copying what, what uh, our book has, that our pioneers denied atonement at the cross. He decided that he would take the ROM drive, which he had recently got, uh, gotten for the pioneers, and see what they were saying. As he examined their earliest statements, he was perplexed, and he sent me a letter with a lot of of quotations and says, I, I'm, I, I'm confused by what I read because it looks to me like they did believe in the atonement at the cross. Well, brothers and sisters, nearly any source that you read, such as light bearers, will tell you that our pioneers, and questions on doctrines, by the way, this is where I was dealing with it, questions on doctrines, authors very clearly stated that they denied atonement of the cross and explained why. The fact is they did not deny atonement of the cross. They proclaimed it for a number of years until W.H. Wagner, E.J.'s father, uh, somehow I presume he was studying O.R.L. Crozier's work, who did deny atonement at the cross, but we did not accept his version of that. But uh, Wagner began to teach in 1858. In 1857, he had an article in the review that hinted that direction, but was not clear. But by 1858, he was very definitely denying uh, atonement of the cross. And at the same time, in 1858, Ellen White's statement was affirming atonement at the cross. Moreover, Uriah Smith, in that same year, possibly, I haven't had a chance to check to see, but possibly in answer to W. Uh, H. Wagner, he has affirmed atonement at the cross. Now, he's one of the earliest ones. Certainly, Ellen White was one of our pioneers. They both, in the same year, affirmed atonement of the cross. However, sometime in the next 10 or 15 years, Uriah Smith was influenced by W.H. Wagner to reject atonement at the cross. And he became the champion. Both men wrote uh, quite a bit on this and wrote books on it. But it was Smith who really, uh, as the editor of Review, imprinted this in the mind of the Adventists, so much so that generation after generation actually believed that our pioneers denied atonement at the cross. 
In my book, Questions on Doctrines Revisited, we will review some chapters. I don't remember if I have that in there, but you'll find it uh, a couple of chapters that relate to this. Whether we can deal with it in the class or not, I don't remember. But uh, Smith insisted after he changed his view that if you believed, if you, um, if you believed in atonement at the cross, that you were either a universalist or an extreme Calvinist. Now, you can understand what happened, actually. He was confusing atonement with justification. And we have had the same problem in our church in the last quarter of a century or more. The confusion of a justification with atonement so that uh, some of our people have been teaching in two different strains, one following Des Ford and the other not following him but claiming that justification, justification took place at the cross. Now, the fact is that justification did not take place at the cross, but atonement did. There is a difference between atonement and justification. Atonement is the provisions for justification. Atonement is what Christ did to offer us so that when we receive his atonement, we are justified. Atonement took place at the cross, brothers and sisters. Justification did not. We'll have a chance to deal with this again. But the confusion between atonement and justification is something that you as individuals need to be very clear about because there are many of our people who are yet teaching a justification at the cross when they should be teaching atonement at the cross. Now, another issue, uh, area of the 25, had to do with the heavenly sanctuary. And in uh, earlier, Crozier had uh, uh, developed the concept of atonement as being completed by Christ in this heavenly sanctuary through the blotting out of sin, both of the sanctuary and of the people and uh, that the blotting out would take place when the sins were placed on the head, on Satan's head, who was the one who instigated it. Uh, Bates was the first one to identify this as a process of investigation judgment. In other words, the view that God was holding open session so that all the beings of the universe could see on what basis he was making his decisions for justifying some and not others. At first, Ellen Wh Elder White felt this was a false idea because it seemed to him that God would not have to review. The fact is the universe needs to review. It's not God, but the universe that needs to see what he has done. And when Elder White did accept it, he himself is the one who coined the term investigative judgment. R. L. Cottrell followed up by his contribu contribution of the distinction between the investigative judgment and the um, executive judgment where the results, the decision of the exec uh, investigative judgment is carried out and executed at the end of the millennium. In the 1840s, the blotting out of sins was considered to be the sins of ignorance. The individuals were to seek out any sins of ignorance and to confess them. In the 1850s, the blotting out of sin was considered to be a judicial act, placing it on the head of, of the scapegoat, which really goes back to Crozier's view in the first place. By the 1860s, this view was broadened and uh, the emphasis was on the elimination of sins from the lives of the saints, a view that Joseph Bates had promoted uh, or had at least suggested 20 years before. Now, initially, our view of the Sabbath was the same as that of 
the Seventh-day Baptists. In fact, we really got our view from the Seventh-day Baptists. And that was very simple, that uh, God's commandments are all valid, and a violation of the, any of the commandments is a sin, therefore a violation of the Sabbath commandment is a sin. So this was the basic view to begin with. But gradually, Bates and White, both, along with uh, Jay and Andrews, uh, connected the Sabbath with the three angels' messages. And the uh, first angel's message, which says, Worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water, which is taken from the fourth commandment. So you have, in all of Revelation, this is the only major quotation from the Old Testament. There are all kinds of references to the Old Testament. But this is an u- unusual, unique uh, application of the Old Testament. The fourth commandment is found in the first commandment, our first uh, angel's message. And to begin with, they saw the messages as sequential, first angel, second angel, First angel was a call to worship God. Second was a call to come out of Babylon. The third was a warning against those who remain in Babylon or to worship uh, the uh, Babylon in any way because they would drink of the wine of the, of the beast, by the way, which is Babylon, relates to Babylon. So what we have now is the first angel message, worship God. Second angel's message, God of Babylon. And the third, showing the judgments of God upon those who fail to come out and those who worship the beast and his image. So that by the 1850s, all three of these were now seen as a part of a single thing. And when they talked about the third angel's message, they always meant the three angels' messages, but they could say the third angel's message because it was the capstone of the three. And when they spoke of the third, it always included all three. Now, in order for them to truly understand and proclaim the third angel's message, they must first define the beast, the image, and the mark. And uh, they did so, as they did so, they found the contrast between the mark of the beast and the seal of God as seen in Revelation 7, 1 to 4, and again in Revelation 14 in in the three angels' messages. But the uh, seal of God then was a It was seen in contrast to the mark of the beast. These are opposite things. And as they studied the seal of God and found that it it represented the Sabbath, and it was Bates and Whites both who came to this conclusion that the true Sabbath, this made the seal, that the mark, more evident of being Sunday, which uh, came a little later. It was Uriah Smith who uh, conceived the idea of illustrating the seal of God by using a monarch seal. Now, in the monarch seal, there are always three different things. It states who is the ruler and what is his dominion and, uh, uh, pardon me, I should say his office and his dominion. The cover area covered. In this case, uh, the uh, mark, of the seal of God, was the Creator, and uh, his. Uh, well, actually, was Jehovah and his office, the Creator, and his dominion, the whole world. It was jo- J. N. Andrews that first developed the concept of the beast being the power of Revelation 13, the first half of chapter 13, where it speaks about the beast. And uh, then uh, later they discovered that the 
Um, and by the way, they identified the beast with the papacy, the Antichrist. And later they identified the image with apostate Protestantism and then the mark as being Sunday sacredness. In 1847, J uh, Joseph Bates had already identified the mark as Sunday, but this was not a generally held view. But as they studied it, they concluded that this was the fact. But Elder White insisted it was not yet given. So it was important for our people to know that no one had the mark of the beast, so they wouldn't be teaching a doctrine that implied that all Sunday keepers were worshipers of the beast and had his mark. Also, uh, during this same period of time, uh, they discovered that the Sabbath was restoring of the breach of Isaiah 58, where it speaks about them being restorer of, of the breach, and that breach being the wall of the law, and the Sabbath being the hole that was brought, brought in. Now, there was another problem at that time uh, regarding Ellen White, because when they were discovering when to begin the Sabbath, Bates for years, as an old sea captain, and was looked up to as a key leader, he insisted that the Sabbath begins at six o'clock. Wherever you are, six o'clock. Ellen White accepted that view. And when uh, Elder White sent Andrews to, to Battle Creek to hold a, a Bible study to determine what does the Bible teach, and they found very strong evidence that it is from even to even, from sunset to sunset. And uh, that uh, was something that from Battle Creek they discovered but there were two people who didn't accept that. Who do you suppose they were? Anyone want to make a guess? On either one? Two key people that did not accept that. Bates. Well, Bates would be illogical, wouldn't, wouldn't it? He'd been promoting six o'clock for years. And... Uh, he was seen as, a, you know, something of an authority. Who else would have been? Can you guess? Ellen White. Ellen White had a reason. Her reasoning went this way. We've been involved now for, I think it was by this time it was 1859. That would be a decade and a half. As a, as a movement. And God had given her messages right from the beginning of that period of time, December of 1844. Now, she reasoned that if the six o'clock was not accurate, he would have shown her. And uh, to her, it was evident that they should leave it at six o'clock. However, then that night after their discussion and so forth, she had a vision. In the vision, she was shown that the Sabbath begins at even, not at six o'clock. And so the next day, she explained to the people that she was wrong. And of course, from her vision, Bates was willing to exceed. The fact is, this is a very important thing. And people claim, by the way, that she couldn't be a prophet because she was 15 years before where the change and she didn't even accept the change when it came. But the fact is, this illustrates an extremely important thing. God did not send Ellen White to present new light. He sent her for the purpose of, of encouraging the movement, of guiding them and in their study of scriptures and of reproving those who violated principle. 
but it was never God's intention that Ellen White present New Light. Whenever Ellen White was involved with the New Light, it was always after the brethren had spent some time in studying it, and it would be a matter of affirmation of what was true. The latter rain was one of those 25 points, and uh, the people expected Christ to come very soon. And they expected to have the latter rain shown in Joel, the third chapter, before Christ came. So they kept looking for the latter rain, but it never happened. They became quite concerned and discouraged about it. Uh, but uh, it was, according to the book, it was in 1856 that Ellen White identified the Sabbatarians as Laodiceans. Actually, the text is wrong. If you look in the earliest of the Review and Herald articles in 1852 and 53, in 1852 there's an indication, in 1853 a very definite a statement of the identifying the Sabbath group as Laodicean. This is a difficult thing for many of them because they had always identified the Sunday keepers as Laodicean. And uh, however, when they begin to study, they realize that this is, this is the last movement and that the Laodicean movement is the last one, that Philadelphia movement was the uh, Millerite movement. And so the group uh, accepted this and expected that this means that they would have the latter rain. And Ellen White had to explain to them later that the, the fact is that the work of the Laodicean message must go much deeper. It is a deep work and that it's not one that would take place uh, right away. We still need to understand the latter rain and in this class, we will show that the Minneapolis message was the latter rain message. And that will be for another time. <clears throat> and that message, by the way, was rejected, and that's why we're still here. Now, another section was on final events. It was in 1847 that Elder James White broke with the normal Protestant concept of the seven last plagues being parallel with the seven churches, seven seals, and seven trumpets. And he uh, took the position uh, in the broadside that they published, the first, first publication, took the position that the uh, uh, Seven last plagues was still future, that it was not to be linked with the seven churches and uh, trumpets and so forth. In uh, 1848, already Bates had identified the problems in Europe where you had the uh, uh, revolutions in the various countries. He saw that as being the troublous time of the uh, of the um, plagues. But Ellen White pointed out the fact that the Lord showed her that this was not the case. The plagues were still future. So the question of final events took time for the brethren to work through and to understand. In 1866, the Review and Herald had, and by the way, I it was not called Review and Herald at that time yet, but that's what it came to be. But at that time, the Review uh, identified the seven-week war of, between Prussia and Austria as possibly leading into the uh, final battle of Armageddon, which is a part of the last uh, seven last plagues. It was the sixth plague that captured their attention, the drying up of the river Euphrates. 
for some time they thought of that drying up of the Euphrates as a literal drying up of the actual river. But in 1857, Uriah Smith suggested that the Euphrates was really a territory. The drying up of the Euphrates was actually the drying up of the Turkish Empire that controlled that area. And uh, he introduced the idea that uh, Turkey then was the king of the north. And the drying up the of the Euphrates had to do with the king of the north coming to his end and then to help him. That was his theory. James White did not accept that view. He continued to believe what Uriah had formerly believed, and that is the king of the north is uh, papacy. And uh, cautioned any uh, one who was dealing with prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled and indicated that it was a, a very serious thing if they should present false interpretations of prophecy, then when they actually takes place, people would not be prepared for it. And also they might become disillusioned because of false interpretations. It was J. N. Andrews who first identified the second beast of Revelation 13 with the United States and the image with apostate Protestantism. He also identified the mark of the beast as Sunday. Now, in that same line of discussions, there was considerable discussion over this generation. You remember Jesus said, this generation shall not pass, except this is, they will see the Son of Man, and so forth. The fact is that was already fulfilled by the three disciples who went with Christ into the Mount of Transfiguration and there witnessed the uh, triumph of, of the glory of Christ at which this was speaking about. But the uh, Cottrell and Kilgore both emphasized the fact that those who saw the stars fall, those who uh, saw the sun and moon darken and so forth, in 1780 and, and 1833, those would be alive before Christ comes. In Christ would come before they would die. So that became a very significant thing. In fact, many people were keeping track of everyone they knew who had seen the stars fall or, the, or that had uh, see, witnessed the dark day, thinking that at least one of those would be in place, like the stars. Falling. Even when I was a young boy, people were still talking about this generation, some of them thinking that maybe someone would still be alive somewhere who was there to see the signs. This generation meaning the generation of the signs. James' comment on this was where the history is not written, the student should put forth his propositions with not too much positiveness. And I would like to repeat that to you for your sakes today. It's awfully easy when you see things happening in Iraq or someplace it looked like it's fulfilling. It may be, it may not be, but be careful how you set forth your conclusions. And I would say that those areas that are not fulfilled, it is a good idea for us to be very humble and recognize that we may not know, even though we may have very strong convictions uh, over and over again through the years. When I was a boy growing up um, and, and, and when I became involved in college, it was common for people to teach that uh, Turkey was the king of the north. Well, the fact is that what was expected didn't happen. And uh, it's important for us to realize that prophecy is given so that Jesus said, so when these things come to pass, you may know. If they haven't yet come to pass, it's important to be very careful how we place our 
convictions. Millennium was another one of those items in the 25. In fact, the last three of the 25, 23, 4, and 5, had to do with events after Christ's coming. And uh, one of the important things that the uh, Adventist people clung to, uh, which they got from Millerites, was the idea that the uh, soul is not immortal. That the, the, die, the those who die fall asleep. And uh, they, some of the Adventists, or the Sabbath group, was not uh, some of the Adventists yet, but the Sabbath group uh, accepted that view because, for one thing, if you believe in immortal soul, it makes the resurrection meaningless. If the soul goes direct to heaven at death, then why was Christ come down to resurrect them from here? It's not a meaningful idea. Another thing was the rise of spiritualism made this doctrine very important because the spirits could come at any time and represent your loved ones who died and give you messages from them, which are really messages from satanic sources. And this happens continually. Every day it's happening many times in our country. Another issue had to do with the fires of hell. What is hell fire? Uh, what, what happens? Are the wicked burned eternally? And the answer is no. Our believers, as they study this through, found that the wicked are turned uh, that the, the, the wicked are turned to ashes instead of burning forever. They become ashes. Indeed, the Bible says there'll be ashes under the soles of our feet. My own grandfather. Uh, I told you the other day about. I think I told you about my grandmother coming to uh, her her neighbor, Jim Fincher, and uh, telling him that he shouldn't be plowing on Sunday. She, he should go to church and keep the Sabbath. He said, well, if you kept the Sabbath, I would keep it with you. Did I tell you that? Well, I'm telling you now. And uh, so he said, well, if, if you kept the Sabbath, I would keep it. Oh, well, I do keep the Sabbath. Don't you know Jesus changed the day? Well, she says, you come to my house tonight and I'll show you. So he came to her house that night. She had her texts all ready, but very soon they dissipated, disappeared because none of those texts had anything to do with Jesus changing the Sabbath. Well, it was a stressful moment for her because she was very devout Cumberland Presbyterian and believed strongly in Sabbath keeping. And uh, so she said, all right, I know it's there. My pastor has repeated it many times. If you come back such and such a time and I'll have, have the text for you. Well, the whole family, my father, his older and his younger brothers, uh, his older brother and his younger brother and his parents, the five of them, spent the night looking for the missing text, which they never found. Uh, it wasn't very long before a culprit came through who sold them a Bible readings and they found the truth about the missing texts. They were missing from Scripture entirely. And so it was that the family became a Sab Sabbath keeping, but one of the members of the family did not become a Seventh-day Adventist when the others did. That was my grandpa. Why? Because he knew that Jesus said that they would burn forever. The wicked would burn forever. And no matter how much they, how, how many passages of scripture, he couldn't hear them. His mind was set. He knew that they would burn forever. One day, while he was reading his Bible, because he was quite a Bible student, and he spent a lot of time reading. While he was reading his Bible, the family heard him say, well, well, 
If the devil and his angels are brought to ashes, there won't be much left of the wicked. <laughs> and so this is how he finally became a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church by accepting the truth of the Bible regarding the hellfire, which really is a matter of cleaning up the earth, cleansing it so that it could be renewed. They learned about the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, the second resurrection where the wicked are raised and come up against the city, and then the fire comes down from God out of heaven and cleanses it from all sin and sinners. We've discussed the health reform, which was another item. As you remember, it, uh, at the very beginning, there was uh, very little understanding of laws of health. But by the 50s, they had learned that tobacco, tea, and coffee were injurious to the physical and spiritual health. It was in 1863, of course, that the health vision was given and they were led to understand that to disregard the laws of health was to violate the sixth commandment. And yet, in 1872, nearly a decade later, they did not spell out the details of this because uh, they were they were presenting only those things that were thoroughly united upon and there were still problems with issues such as draft decorum and health habits. And as a matter of fact, I'm sad to say that never has the, has <coughs> the whole church and its membership accepted the health message in, in whole, maybe in parts. It's tragic because today, as never before, everything that Ellen White presented on the subject of health has been confirmed. And uh, the health specialists who are not Seventh-day Adventists are led to, to uh, be very astonished that anyone during that period could bring about a uniform system of reforms in which there was no error. Because almost everyone, virtually all the reformers, <clears throat> were correct in some areas and often other areas. But her works have, have uh, <clears throat> stood the test of time. Church finance, you remember that to begin with, uh, there was no financial plan. Every minister who went from place to place had to make his own way, except as members generously gave to him, and nearly all of them had to work considerably. James White had to reap the fields in order to secure the funds for travel and so forth. There was no payment. They had no check, nothing but, but to what they could earn and what God uh, provided for them through uh, offerings. <clears throat> In 1857, there was an economic panic. And there were several of the key workers, including the very important ones, Jane Andrews, Jane Lufferow, and uh, others who were found it necessary to quit preaching and to take a job to take care of their family because there was no way there was not uh, the members had very little and and they were simply not giving to them to help them with their work and this was a hard time it was in 1859 that Ellen White suggested to James that he send Andrews to the Battle Creek and that they study the question and that there was a systematic plan in the scriptures and that, he, to, that they find that plan and seek to follow it. Now, the interesting thing, God could have easily given Ellen White a li list of texts and, 
and look at the evidences, and she could have presented it, but she didn't. That was not God's plan. Remember, the spirit of prophecy is not given to, to develop new doctrines. God's plan is for the gift for the uh, prophet to encourage his people, to teach them and things from the scriptures, and to uh, reprove those who uh, fall away, and to be just a general a spiritual guide, but not one to whom you go for for new light. When we come to Minneapolis, we find the president urgently asking Ellen White, tell us what is right. She never t did because God hadn't shown her. The only time she uh, presented anything was what God had shown her, and God did not choose to resolve theological problems by the spirit of prophecy. Later on, we'll find the same thing happening with the daily controversy. It's happened with, with many. Ellen White never did uh, present a new doctrine to the church. She affirmed the doctrines when they were studied, but she did not present them. <clears throat> it was in 19, 1861 that James White, uh, by, by the way, in, I, I don't think I finished, about 59, Anders went to Battle Creek. They studied the issue thoroughly, and they developed what they, was called the Systematic Benevolence Program, and it was called uh, Sister Betsy. <laughs> Systematic Benevolence, Sister Betsy, just for short. It was an affectionate term, <clears throat> and uh, as a result of that Systematic Benevolence Plan, uh, which is not exactly a tithing program, but moving toward it, is the church uh, was blessed. In 76, the uh, General Conference took the action that under normal circumstances, the individuals should devote 10% of all their income to the church. Now, before they had indicated the property, 10% of the property, but that's not a very good thing. Some people have no property. Some have a lot of property, but not much income. But at any rate, this was a more moving toward the tithing system. But then in the panic before this, 76, but that which made this important was the panic of 73 they were still involved in uh, because the people have been slow to respond to the General Conference recommendation because they had very little money. But at that time, the General Conference voted to have a, uh, in 78, to have a, a uh, pamphlet uh, devoted to uh, the tithe question as it was in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. As a result of this, together with the improving economics of the country, it was a great relief financially for the churches. Now, another issue they addressed in the 25 was the prophetic gift. I see it's time for us to close our discussion. Uh, just a few words about it. The Proposition third, uh, Article third, uh, 16 uh, was to affirm the, our belief in the spiritual gifts and then to indicate that these are not to control the church, but that our authority is in Scripture. And uh, that the gifts have a very important play, place to play, especially in the last days. In the Bible, it shows that the gift of prophecy will be uh, existing in the last days. And uh, again, uh, uh, James White, I think, I, oh yes, I mentioned this Bates uh, because of 6 p.m. But it was in connection with that that James White made the statement that it does not appear as though the Lord's desire to teach his people by the gifts of the Spirit, uh, but on Bible questions until his servants have thoroughly and diligently searched the Word of God. <clears throat> Our next lesson 
will be the road to Minneapolis. Now, you will find in your syllabus, this will be shown for not next Wednesday, but for the following meeting after our break. But we will have this for our next meeting because we've combined the two lessons in one. Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you that you have guided us, that you have understood our need to learn through trial and error, and that you have given us the guidance that we need. I pray that you'll teach us the lessons that many of our forebears found difficult to learn. In the name of Jesus, amen.